Adam Bean and welcome to the 61st edition of Airhex TV. Is the first Airhex with su summertime actually. It's almost summer here. So let's start with topics. And um, the very first topic is tomorrow is the bootstrap at Munich Airport. And after that we have effective. And I cancelled everything else. And the reason for that is, uh, yeah, lots of work, lots of project requests. And, um, and I shifted almost everything to winter. And uh, so this is the um, schedule, and it's going to be probably the smallest air hacks next uh, to tomorrow. It's around 10 people. So prepare your questions if you are attending tomorrow. And uh, the first time I will also mix Jakarta E, Java E, and Micro Profile in the bootstrap. So I will not separate that. So now, what happens in winter? So uh, we already have the room. So in December the 10th, there will be Jakarta E and Micro Profile microservices. So we will code a lot of microservices with stock Jakarta E and Micro Profile. The day two, December 11th. So the agenda is not done yet and uh, registration is not open yet. But uh, if you would like to participate in all three or all two, you can register the first one and just mention I would also attend the second day. But what I plan to do is to, uh, to play a little bit with Java E and Clouds and to show you a cloud concepts, uh, different cloud vendors, also OpenShift and uh, what's the difference of so starting with Docker then moving to clouds with uh, Java E and uh, MicroProfile. And the last day is like going wild. We will go way beyond Java E and the standards and uh, just uh, we will uh, play a little bit and talk about NoSQL databases, uh, meshes like Istio, what's the added value, reactive, serverless, and uh, whatever uh, is not mainstream, we will do at the very last day. Also, um, I think it is in November, uh, late November, there will be uh, two workshops um, regarding front end. This is going like the bootcamp on bootstrap uh, web standards or web and effective web. So very similar to the bootstrap Java E and effective, the same will be with web apps. So I had no time to announce this both. But uh, I think, as I remember, they uh, both workshops are one or two weeks before this one. Okay, now let's start with topics. And we have surprisingly uh, uh, plenty of topics because, not because, I don't know why, the, um, the problem or the problem uh, we only had two weeks. I was very late with the March air hack. So in two weeks Lots of uh, topics were gathered. So the very first question is, 16 days ago, as you see, so in two weeks, it says, um, Adam, I am working on a project which uses a JavaScript in the front end and Jakarta in the back end. I would like to persist submitted form data containing a picture and save this picture as blob, so binary large object, despite the shortcomings in a, My, in a MySQL database. I tried the method below but JSON B fails during serialization of the candidate picture field. Yes, it should fail. And uh, why? Because uh, there is no data type in JSON binary. There is no binary data type. So you cannot serialize and deserialize binary data type using JSON, at least not with standard JSON. And uh, first, uh, you don't have to use uh, J is it jQuery actually? Wait, wait a second. Yes. You don't have to use a jQuery, you could just use stock fetch. And what you could also do, you could use a form data. It's called form data, it's a web standard to, to, to send the stuff. And the problem is here with application JSON. What you could do, you could send, a, um, how it's called, a form encoded. I think, I forgot, form, like the standard form encoded format. And uh, then the picture is going to be encoded or decoded by the application server without JSON. Or you can send the JSON data first as metadata and then stream with binary. And uh, if, you, if you search for binary fetch MDN for Mozilla Developer Network, you will find examples. And then you can stream whatever you like to the server. And on the server, you can just receive the stream. And as I remember, I either recorded already a... Uh, screencast or uh, describe that even on my blog, how to stream something to the server. Okay, this is uh, the very first question. I hope it's crystal clear. Okay, the so next one. 
is actually my thing is uh, Quarkus and this should be actually the very first one and during the last uh, Airhex TV someone asked me you know uh, what is my what are my thoughts on unicurls and also what I did I recorded a few screencasts regarding Quarkus they should be somewhere uh, yeah this Quarkus as a thin jar on docker and uh, hello Quarkus uh, native Jaxores CDI executables and there is supersonic subatomic CDI so and what Quarkus is uh, Quarkus is um, a open source um, framework from Red Hat and uh, it's Java E based it uses subset of Java E but the interesting thing is actually two things are interesting with Quarkus first it does the fed jar uber jar without uh, being fed or uber so the, they separate the business logic from the infrastructure from the beginnings so is very similar approach to thin wars and they only support a subset of Java e, which I usually don't like but what you get out of that is they are able to uh, to uh, natively compile the Java e application to a binary executable. So and then we are a unikernel. So what do you what do you, what do you get is you get a Java e unikernel for free with Quarkus, which also answers one of the questions from last year hacks. And uh, the question is why it is good. First, the unikernel is just a fraction of the memory requirements from uh, JVM Java Virtual Machine. And it starts incredibly fast. So the, the Quarkus also starts very fast. So now you can ask me, you know, uh, why it's interesting. So um, I had in in uh, in one of my projects, commercial project, it could be interesting because what we probably will have to do is to write a kind of load balancer or a gateway, and uh, we should be able to start multiple gateways. And this this is we will uh, like to use JaxRS and CDI for that. And Quarkus would be actually great. Also, uh, if you think about this, my the whole block right now it's a, it's a Java E server, but it could be easily transformed to Quarkus. It um, it would just work, so there would be no huge benefit. But because I'm not you know scaling dynamically my my block engine, but uh, but uh, it would be good enough you know for Quarkus. I don't need here JCA connectors or uh, transactions for my block because it's. I would say in most cases read only and once a day usually I've, I'm writing something. So this is uh, interesting. So and uh, you know if you if you look at the comments, uh, the uh, uh, watchers or uh, or listeners ask me, you know, I'm moving away from Java e, not at all. But uh, the first time, you know, in uh, in uh, so something which is uh, I would say kind of lightweight. And it comes with added value. All other attempts with uh, Whitefly Swarm and Pyara Micro were just repackaging the server. You got some, you know, minor improvements, but I, I was absolutely not interested in it. But uh, with that, you get some, uh, you get some added value. So uh, this uh, uh, about Quarkus. Now, what's also interesting, I had some uh, interviews with. Uh, on on earhex.fm, so this is my podcast, and with Bruno Borges again, and we this time it was just one hour content about serverless servers and runtimes, which um, I, I also had to rethink some of my ideas. For instance, in this podcast, I found out that actually the name runtime might be better suited as servers for serverless, and uh, so if you're interesting. Uh, Take a look or take an ear <laughs> on it. And the next is uh, completely different. So um, I had a chance to interview Simon Hara. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, Java by Comparison. And the book is great. This is from Pragmatic Programmer's book. And the amazing story is uh, Simon is a teacher at the University of Bamberg our professor in the University of Bamberg and uh, what he did he had uh, he had Java courses for students and uh, in the course of several years he had to review lots of you know home assignments and then he wrote the book Java by comparison uh, this this one with a pragmatic bookshelf and I read the book because he asked me about that and um, I share a lot of ideas from the book I think there were from 70 examples I was just two which I was not entirely happy with but uh, 
this book is like, you know, my ideas applying to Java, Java E without Java E. So it's a really interesting book to read. And uh, uh, it's just like uh, same thinking, you know, no interfaces and uh, no abstract in naming. So really interesting. And what I also was able, by re after reading that book, remove some of my code. For instance, it's not necessary to have public unit tests, public methods and unit tests. You can remove the public in unit tests, so you can, you know, save another word or a couple of words because one unit, unit test comprises multiple methods. And also, similar topic, uh, I had a conversation with Sebastian Daschner. Now he's working at IBM, <laughs> so at his team. Enterprise Service Booth Officer, which is not true. He's lead Java advocate for Java. Oh, lead Java advocate for Java. I think lead advocate for Java. So I have to double check that. Um, and we had a conversation about serverless again and what would be the benefit of Istio on OpenShift. So might be interesting. So now, and uh, if you are interested in Quarkus and if you are interested in GMS and Kafka and this stuff, you should, you know, uh, subscribe to the Airhex FM podcast or at least check it double check the, the, the feed uh, the next Sunday and the Sunday Sunday after that okay I'm keeping releasing the um, the podcasts uh, weekly and um, because uh, my queue is full right now podcast view is full until it empties a bit a bit and then I will probably come back to the bi-weekly cadence okay podcast killed so now uh, McCarthy, really enjoy your videos and advice. Thank you a lot. I really enjoy the time. The, the first Monday of the month is for me like, you know, almost tradition. So um, I wonder if you could explain the reasons why a team would should choose a single page SPA rather than a request response model. Um, benefits, drawbacks. I think that single page apps with some JS framework such as React, Angular, Vue, are the default choice at the moment for lots of application teams, but the decision is not based on any sound analysis thought. thought. Interested in your thoughts on this? I would say, for me, it is pretty easy distinction. For instance, so workshops, not SPA. So this is actually a typical application, so you can register here. Uh, it is uh, not even JavaScript involved. My block, not, I think, and I don't think JavaScript at all. I don't, and probably the Roller Web Engine has some JavaScript, but I don't think I have any JavaScript. It's not a single page app. It doesn't have to be. So it would be, there's actually no added benefit of having a SPA here. Uh, what else? Uh, the TV, the whole air hacks, oh, this is now we will get a feedback loop because I, I would see my Sam self streaming. What happens actually? Like, wait a second. Um, okay. So this is like time travel. I see myself five minutes ago. But uh, the whole thing is not SPA. And um, so uh, if you think, so we can go podcast, news, books, about whatever I do here. It's just documents which are linked together. Confluence doesn't have to be SPA, so like a wiki. Um, so the distinction is, um, is your content something like a book or or uh, you know, uh, just a collection of documents, which uh, is like a traditional page with lots of content, and uh, the single page application is a substit substitution of uh, fed clients or rich clients or applications. So in most of my uh, projects, if we are speaking about SPA, I immediately thinking about. Uh, Thick clients, fat clients, Swing, JavaFX, uh, just rewritten with JavaScript and HTML and CS. So the browser is used or misused as JVM and the whole application is running inside the browser. And by the way, uh, in the recent projects, we didn't use any JavaScript frameworks at all. Uh, we just stick with the web standards, which is very similar to Swing and JavaFX then. So th this is these are the basic thoughts. So what it means is, if you are building, you know, an enterprise uh, site which is informational only, mostly read only, then you don't need any uh, any JavaScript framework. But if your website is not a website, rather than an application, 
which uh, even competes with a native application, then it's absolutely true that it's not even an SPA rather than PWA, progressive web app, which is, means it is even offline capable. Also in a distinction, this request response model cannot be offline capable, and PWA and SPA can be uh, offline capable, and usually they are with service workers. Cool, I hope it's crystal clear right now. Now, Victor, ask me. I want to know if there's a way which is more elegant than JCA to read from TCP socket connection. By the way, JCA is actually really elegant. Uh, you have to only implement a view classes and, have you, and you have it. And by the way, uh, having a TCP connection via uh, socket, so client TCP connection is not a problem. Server TCP connection is a problem because it will block you know, your, your servers. And uh, what you can do is, for instance, think about this. You can, for sure, it is not, it is not completely Java -E co compliant, but it will work. It will be st stable, so um, or Java -E, uh, EJB compliant. So there are some programming restrictions. But uh, what you can do, you can have application scope CDI bean or uh, at Singleton EJB, which opens the uh, server uh, socket, and then uh, you know transforms whatever comes in into a CDI event and distributes the events. Um, so this, this could be one possible case. Also, if you search for Adam Bean E2 FTP, I've wrote an FTP server on Java E7 a uh, long time ago, six years ago. And I actually forgot <laughs> what I did. Uh, what I remember is um, I used, I think, Apache Mina as a socket server. So you can just take a look what I did back then. What I just remember, I try to be as lightweight as possible. <laughs> and uh, so if you like, uh, take a look on that. And um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's without JCA connectors. So, um, okay. Now, I hope we cover that. And uh, client TCP is not a problem. For instance, JaxRS uh, client also uses Zocans behind the scenes and it just works. So let's say we have two Payara servers. Uh, instances where we have two apps deployed and to communicate with each other use JMS. Now should I have a third instance of Payara server to play the role of message broker or what would be the J Javaistic way? And uh, by the way, this is uh, one of the next podcasts we will talk about a little bit about JMS and Kafka. And this is the problem. Yes, you will have to start something outside of your two microservices. The problem with it is it should be highly available because if it isn't highly available, uh, what will then happen, of course, is um, if, uh, if it breaks, the two microservices cannot communicate with each other. And, uh, you know, trying to set up a GMS server uh, in a, in, as an HA, uh, you know, it has to be highly available in a cluster, clustered way, is not trivial. And it's also not trivial as uh, uh, setting up, you know, Kafka in a HA or clustered way. And as you will hear in the subsequent podcasts, uh, the estimation are a few weeks of work, you know, to make it uh, to 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 make it work Kafka in a clustered environment. But in most projects, developers don't care about that. What they just do, you know, they install Kafka in a on a single node or install GMS on a single node, and they communicate um, via GMS, and then no one cares about operations or productions. So this is the sad story. So yes, you will have to start something outside. And uh, if you start something outside, it has to be highly available. And therefore, what I, uh, if your company is running, you know, MQ series or um, uh, WebSphere MQ, I think is the, the newer name, then go with it because it is already clustered uh, by operations and such systems play a crucial role in uh, most enterprise companies. So you can just use the already existing infrastructure and you don't have to set up it uh, by yourself. How you manage transactions between microservices in Java E? I, well, we don't have transactions between microservices in Java E. And uh, actually, I think last week I helped uh, a startup with a payment gateway where uh, they had uh, duplicates, du the duplicate transactions. And um, we managed to do this without uh, microservices and uh, with idempotent behavior. And uh, why we had to do this? Because, uh, yeah, because the payment gateway was not transactional. This was a. Uh, uh, 
XML uh, or XML, it was a uh, remote procedure call, which was not transactional. So you should not or you must not rely on two-phase commit and distributed transactions. What you should rely on is how this will work is every microservice supports local transactions, so it is consistent and persistent, but uh, uh, it's not like the transaction, so let's say the... Um, a composite uh, microservice or a microservice gateway must not start, you know, a overarching transaction and try to coordinate other microservices. This is uh, not a best practice. It it won't usually work. It w could slow down your system, and one malicious microservice could, you know, slow down the whole process. So uh, what you should do is to re rethink the business logic and uh, support um, rollback. Um, or how it's called, uh, uh, not rollback transactions, forgot the term, it's like um, uh, undo transactions, but there's a better name for that. So what it means is if you, if you book a flight and you book a hotel, then if you uh, committed already the flight bookings, but you cannot get the room in the hotel, then you can still cancel the flight in a subsequent transaction. And uh, hence the name is compensative transaction. So now, not under transactions, compensative transactions. So, Jesse Farinacci asked me, what do you endorse and why? Flyway versus liquid base versus something else. So I like Flyway a lot. Um, it's very simple. You have SQL statements and fly, fly one, Flyway is running the SQL statements and store the results in a, uh, let's say, status table. And liquid base, um, is more powerful than Flyway. So if you're just dealing with one database, I will suggest Flyway. If you have to support multiple databases and uh, you would like to translate uh, a, a dialect or higher, higher, how it's called, higher order language, uh, which specifies, you know, the, um, the DDL, um, to multiple databases, then I would use Liquibase. So in most of my projects, I prefer Flyway right now. Okay, hope it's clear. Now, CRED11. Uh, not exactly J question or Java, but still wondering how to model database and entity objects for REST backend serving multilingual data things. And um, I think I had already a similar question, so uh, I'm wondering also either this is um, follow-up or uh, CRED11 was not happy with my answer, but um, multilingual, what, what do you mean first? Uh, how to detect the language of the user? So you can, you know, check out from JWT token preferred language or try to, you know, to read uh, the browser preferred language. But uh, what, uh, I'm actually, if you think about this, what should happen? So um, it is a similar, similar challenge as, uh, I would say, multi-tenancy a little bit. So depending on the user, you will have to uh, to return different languages and what you can do, you can, you know, return IDs which are resolved on the client and if the, um, and if the data has to come from a database, so it's stored on the server, what you could do is you can inject, for instance, the language of the preferred language of the user which is extracted from the J JSON web token or for kind of a profile and um, and then use it as a query uh, filter and to search in a tables for different languages. This is what I would do, for instance. Um, yeah, but it's really hard to tell, you know, what you're building. If you're building a CMS content management system, then, uh, you know, you have to, to be more flexible in the multi-language way. If you're just building a business apps, uh, you can probably go away with that, what I told you right now. So I hope it answers your question. Um, yeah, serv serving, yeah. So first, the first idea would be that you are serving uh, the whole static stuff. You are just serving, let's say, a default language is English. You will serve everything in English and uh, translate it on the client. Or if the data has to come from server, you could inject the preferred language from the user at in you know string at inject and then produce it with uh, from the uh, json web token and um and then use it as a selector in databases and serve you know the already translated or or language specific json data to the user now tunji dir ask me so this is very long 
very long question. So what I ask you is, your question should be Javaistic, so as concise as only as possible. This question is not Javaistic. It looks like Cargo Cult projects, you know, in my uh, source code from Cargo Cult projects, where there's you no know, multiple layers, DTOs of DTOs and mappers, and I don't know what. And uh, yeah, but we try to extract, you know, the idea. So the first question is singleton with bin managed concurrency type. So, so first, hi Adam, I hope you are well. This is a question, of course. I mean, I'm writing Java code and JavaScript code uh, without frameworks, so I should be happy, right? So um, no one forces forced me so far to, to use strange frameworks, so I'm really happy. So next one. Please, what is your take on you synchronized in singleton bin? Are you synchronized in singleton bin with bin managed concurrency type? Assuming I want a method to perform some asynchronous request. Uh, strange. Because a uh, bin without managed concurrency, everything is synchronized. If you, if you have a singleton bin with a bin managed concurrency, then there are no logs at all. So uh, there is an annotation, I think, uh, read log and write log. So take a look on that, and this annotation comes with EGB. Now, secondly, this is a good one. I get confused a lot with system tests and integration tests. Recently, I was in a project where Achillean was being used to build a war file with the dependencies, a container managed application server was started and system tests were be being run as integration tests. I get confused all over again. Please could you give a very simple layman t definition of integration tests and maybe example of what an integration test might look like without using Achillean. Um, or, 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 I think, and in the case of using Archelian to build war and start an application server, does that pass a system test or integration test? So, uh, for me, it's crystal clear, and in most projects, I don't use Archelian at all. I used um, Archelian in one project intensively, and what I had to do is to create different deployments, wars, with different contents in order to test uh, pluggability or plugins in my Java E system, so there is no way without Archelian to test that. In, a, in an other project I uh, implemented for Vardin, but this was like, I would say, eight years ago, I guess, different scopes, and I had to test whether these scopes are running or working properly, so I used uh, Archelian for that. In most of my business applications, uh, I delete Archelian, it's not used anymore, or there is no killer feature for that. So, and how it looks like is very simple. Unit tests are JUnit tests, and there is no difference to Java SE apps. And by the way, if you're interested in it, there is a Java e testing workshop. Where is it? Airhacks.io. Oh, not ill. I.O. Airhacks ill would be also interesting. What happens? Um, Airhacks.io. And there's a training called Java testing. And I hope I um, describe what is the difference. I actually implemented all kind of tests with and without Archelian, but also explain hopefully the difference JUnit and, and all the other tests. But um, what I usually do, I take the uh, definition from Wikipedia <laughs> because it is uh, easily accessible. And unit test is the, uh, is the uh, I would say, the smallest or the most fine-grained test, and it tests one method. So what it means is I mock everything out, also all the dependencies, so that these are my unit tests. And in my projects, unit tests are only allowed to test complex, complicated code, at least, you know, if else, or a for loop or something. So you would be not allowed to test getters and setters, constructors, or enums, because in the history of Java, an enum never failed, I would say. Okay. So this, these are unit tests, and uh, in CRUD project has almost no unit tests, and in more complicated projects we have a couple of unit tests. Now, integration tests, um, a typical case of integration tests in my projects are tests for the JPA entities. So we are starting, without our Killian, uh, the entity manager, how the, and the code is like persistence.createEntityManagerFactory.createEntityManager, so it's one liner. And then we are ab able to test all the entities. So if you will search for that, and my name probably you will find some examples in, on my blog. 
So um, these are integration tests and system tests for me is uh, the Archean is completely forbidden because what I have to do is I have to test the system from outside uh, without being depending on it because it's a very realistic test. So it's like a black box test. So the system test is a complete different module which uses JAXORS client to test the first microservice. And in most projects it's like this. Okay. Now, uh, the next question is, how do you handle shared entity classes between two microservices handled by different teams? So um, very easily, there are no shared entities. Uh, it means uh, copy and paste. Yeah, it's copy and paste with um, copy and paste. And uh, you already uh, suggested JSONP might be. If you don't like JSONP, JSONB. But uh, very important is uh, um, the uh, both teams have their own entity sets which are completely independent from each other. Exception from the rule, let's say your entities are standardized. Uh, for instance, some insurance companies have a standard, so you could reuse and all the standardized uh, entities because they will never change. They are versioned externally. But uh, otherwise, uh, I wouldn't share anything between microservices. Now, I am new to BC structuring, boundary control entity structuring and I have a question about that say I have a block application I'm building so very good do I have a component post with a BC structure and another component comment with another BC structure exactly mind you the comment entity has a many to one relationship with the post entity with this am I still minimizing coupling and maximizing cohesion with package would be a filter reside in so I think so because hopefully your post component will also have more classes than just a post. So there will be like a post, articles, and uh, whatever, uh, uh, validators, you know, to prevent malicious posts. And the comment will uh, have users and, uh, let's say, comment validators. So and then the cohesion within the comment is pretty high because everything is comment related and in post is everything post related. And we have minor coupling because of the one to many relation. This is how I would see that. Okay. Um, yes, what package would be a web filter reside in? A uh, web filter? First, if this is like a course filter, it is in the, on the top level. So I have JAXRS application and uh, in parallel to JAXRS application would be, um, would be uh, your filter. Or do you just drop in the application layer since filters all the requests? Yes, uh, this is like a tree structure. Whatever is generic is you now on the top level, and the more specific it gets, the more it is in the leaves. I hope it's natural. Um, so I've been looking at adding a data source URL to a Docker image. I pretty much understand that, but then how does it work behind the scenes? Supposing I have a local DB running, does Docker connect the data source URL with my local DB? Will request to fetch some data from the database fail if the local DB is not running? Sorry if this sounds dumb. I'm just exploring Java E with Clown and all its wonderful features. Thanks. So what I think is not realistic to have a URL. It is a realistic to have portions of your URL. For instance, what you usually will do uh, let's say uh, your um, database, the URI is like uh, localhost colon 5432 for Postgres slash block DB. So what varies is the host. And um, what you will do is in the clouds, you would get, so what you will do is the localhost, you would replace with environment entry and name it database. Uh, yeah. And uh, locally, you will map the database to a different name than globally. Or you can both just both map without uh, any environment uh, entries to, let's say, uh, DB or your block DB. And then you will name just containers after that, because if both containers are running in the same network, uh, the container name is the host name. So this is in Docker. On OpenShift, also similar story. You can just use, you know, the service name. It's called the local local service name, I think, to to, to get the container. But um, to uh, precisely answer your question, you are resolving environment entries and you're starting Docker with minus E parameter or minus n file, I think. 
and you you are um, giving the container you know the key value pairs and you are resolving your uh, host database host differently very good next one uh, let's see what happens in Twitter so Twitter is quiet and there is one valid and very good so we are already pretty fast so next question is TN or T NAS create asked me nine hours ago I'm new to open Liberty and MicroProfile. how to upload files using MicroProfile on open Liberty do I need to add extra dependencies if you if you would like to upload files with the you know file upload HTML standard file upload field you will need additional dependencies like um, I think uh, they're using uh, CXF so there is additional dependencies on it because not part of the JAX REST portion but if you would just you know upload a file uh, using stream there is no external dependency needed because in JAX REST way uh, you can just accept I think uh, input stream and uh, then you can stream whatever you like so but I guess you are asking explicitly form file upload and then you will need an additional dependency, yes. Franden, three hours ago, asked me, and this is an interesting question because I'm exactly in the, the have the same problem right now. What he's basically saying is um, that uh, we should use constructor injection instead of field injection, which is not my, which I don't get because uh, just, you know, adding constructors is uh, adds more bloat without any additional benefit and uh, what I do exactly what you are doing I'm just uh, proposing having fields and developers like it node constructors and then uh, even I don't have private fields um, and what then of course happens is that the sonar cube complains and we change the rules so uh, we change a lot of rules because in my eyes we should not you know follow blindly sonar cube we should use uh, sonar cube as an added value tool and um, i will have in a few weeks a uh, meeting with you know sonar cube uh, master or a master of sonar cube for a particular company because i would change would like to change a lots of rules um, and this is like you know there are uh, many you know uh, strange rules like uh, 80 percent of javadoc or uh, methods has to be javadoc or uh, you know code coverage and uh, no private injection and even worse there are rules like uh, every class has to be a public default constructor which is actually wrong from java e perspective because uh, we get an empty constructor and what the developers will do will just you know add business logic into the constructor so there are lots of strange rules in sonacube and uh, yeah what we should probably do is gather these rules you know somewhere and then go to Sonacube and say, hey guys, just remove the rules from, from Java E profile. This could be, or write a blog post about that. This, this could be actually a good idea. So I'm completely with you. Uh, I, I don't like, you know, the Sonacube driven development. Albots Droid, three hours ago. And this is very interactive workshop. Uh, Monsieur Albots Droid said, I know I'm late to the party, but I added a couple of questions. Hopefully you will have some time to go over them. Of course I will. Uh, so let's go over them. Do you deploy one war, war per Java e server? Yes, always. The last, I don't know, how many years? Adam Bean, last uh, one war per server. So this is 2013 was 2013 I already did it for a few years so it's for six years I'm doing this uh, so since 2013 I cannot I, I'm pretty sure I never deployed multiple wars to one server except of course like a sidecar war like a one war which has just an admin functionality or minor you know supporting functionality but not one major war and in uh, I would say 98 percent of all cases just one war so since six years just one war. Do you deploy more than one JA application server in the same physical server or virtual machine? Physical server? On my physical server, yes. On my physical servers, I have multiple application servers, but they are running in Docker. 
and I have probably, I would say, 10 Docker containers with various application servers. One with my blog, other one, you know, the workshop registration is another one, statistic is another one, some, uh, you know, experiments, and uh, yeah, a couple of servers. Yes, this is true. I have multiple application servers per one physical, uh, but not virtual machine. So I don't have virtual machines, but I have a Docker host, and on the Docker host, I have mu multiple application servers. On a virtual machine is strange, so I will try, you know, to have, uh, yeah, it really depends uh, how heavy your virtual machine is, but uh, I would try to keep them isolated. So, in multi-war projects, how do you handle authentication? Um, no difference to now, J JSON Web Token. Do you have a separate dedicated war for authentication? So, as I already said, uh, multi-war projects, I did was the last one was probably 2011 or 2012, so... In a multi-war project, how do you handle authentication? Do you have a separate dedicated war for authentication and every other war delegates to that one? Probably. So I have one war which uh, is the, you know, the gateway or has the public APIs and the other wars are probably, you know, behind the scenes. It's like microservices. So they are misusing your application server as, let's say, a Docker container, right? So in, in this particular case, the one war would be, you know, REST facing or JavaScript facing and we'll just talk to the other wars. And the first war will have set up, you know, the whole uh, JSON Web Token authentication and then we'll just pass the JSON Web Token to the other wars and the other wars will just verify the signature and, you know, convert the token to roles and users. Yes. I hope this completely, yeah, done. What do you use for service discovery? How do you wars find each other? They, so in um, as I said, in one application server, they I don't I don't do it. If there are multiple application servers, let's say, on uh, on Docker or OpenShift, this is there is no issues of discovery because, let's say, you name one server, you know. Um, that value add tax calculator. So uh, if you if you name it this way and you push it by a convention of a configuration to OpenShift or Docker, I would expect the name would be the same of the Docker container or of the OpenShift service, Kubernetes service. And then the name of the container becomes the host name. So uh, you know already in your, let's say, order application that you need a uh, value add uh, a VAT calculator, VAT calc app, and then you just say HTTP colon VAT calc colon 8080 because it's default and, and you have the reference. So the whole service discovery was never an issue in my project and I really wonder why there is so much discussion around that because with conventions you always, um, I would say you have the problem if you don't have Docker or you have Docker without Docker network or you have something which is not OpenShift, then uh, you need something, you know, to build by yourself. But if you use something like OpenShift uh, the, uh, and use proper names, you just rely on the name, right? Okay, we are done. I hope everyone is very happy. Uh, we have... Um, the uh, We have one from Derek Moore. We have contributed to Liquibase CDI module so we could move away from Flyway. Oh, Derek, is it interesting why you wanted to uh, move away from Flyway? Because uh, I like Flyway a lot. I now do end-to-end -end system tests on thin slices assembled with Archelian deployments. Okay. Uh, okay. So we are done. See you on upcoming conferences. And uh, save the date. Where was it? I think it was December the workshops. December the 10th. Before Christmas, we will start with MicroProfile and hybrid clouds and clouds and OpenShift and uh, probably something else. I'm just uh, thinking what we can do in, in on one day. But uh, I will probably even use some real clouds and to show how easy it is to deploy Java e applications to clouds. And in the last day, um, beyond boring Jakarta E and JDK 12. Now, uh, why... I submitted, you know, a half of the workshops and the idea is, or the idea, the reason is, there was one nice guy, an architect from a Nigerian Central Bank, bank uh, last Airhex, and he asked me, please, 
Uh, can you publish, you know, the dates for the winter uh, as soon as possible? You know, I, I need a visa and I would really like to visit Airhex again. And he was interested in, I think, either public clouds or beyond and boring Jakarta. -y. So now you have the dates. So welcome back to Munich. And um, and uh, the architect from uh, the Nigerian bank had really great use cases, like uh, they had to support lots of transactions per second. And we used to know his use cases and discuss the architecture with the attendees, which was uh, real fun. So I'm looking forward uh, to that. And yes, so thank you for watching. See you at uh, next month and uh, check out Airhex FM. There are some interesting stuff, hopefully interesting stuff uh, is coming up. And uh, if you if you have a time, you know, uh, read Java by Comparison book from uh, Simon Hara and play with Quarkus. So thank you and bye.